Hi, I'm Zach Davis here with America Media, and we are joined today uh, from Spain, Madrid, with Father James Allison, who's here to help us remember René Girard, the great Catholic philosopher, Stanford French professor, immortal of the Académie Française, um, who died this past week. Uh, Father Allison, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. So uh, I was wondering if you could, uh, just to get us started off, maybe give a summary of what were Girard's uh, his ideas and maybe who he was as a person? Well, who he was as a person, let's start with that first bit of biography to remember him at, his, at the time of his passing. He died aged 91. He was born in Avignon on Christmas Day in 1923. He moved to the United States after having done his initial studies as an historian in Paris. He moved to the United States in 1947, where he taught in a variety of places in Indiana, uh, the University of Indiana in uh, Bloomington, in uh, Bryn Mawr, Johns Hopkins, uh, Buffalo, uh, and, and again, again Johns Hopkins, and eventually Stanford, um, where he spent the, the last years of his life living in Palo Alto as a, an emeritus professor there. Um, his, his central idea was what put it in a, a nutshell, what I call the, um, the mimetic or triangular theory of desire. In other words, that we desire according to the desire of another, rather than, rather than desire coming out from somewhere within me to an object outside me, like I want that bicycle or that house or that person. Um, we are uh, we borrow our desires. Our desire, as it, as it were, is inducted, is induced in us by a model. So it's as we see someone desiring something, the desire for that thing opens up in us. Uh, and this affects every aspect of our life, making us much less the uh, insular individuals that we sometimes think of ourselves as being, and much more the malleable, um, very, very sociable uh, very socially constructed members of the human race. Um, so that's the first part of his thought. Linked to that is the realization that once it's become clear quite how mimetic or imitative we are as humans, how much we are run by what each other desires, then it becomes clear how much room there is for rivalry turning into violence. And it's that um, that, if you like, for which he became famous, because the question arose, given that this was almost certainly something that started very early in our process of hominization, <laughs> mm -hmm. in other words, mm -hmm. that we became apes whose capacity for imitation outstripped our natural and instinctive breaks on group violence. Um, how was it? And how is it that we, this hypermimetic ape, managed to control ourselves, managed not to destroy ourselves? And René's solution to this was what he called the mechanism of the emissary victim, or the mechanism of the aleatory victim, which became known as the scapegoat theory. Right, right. <laughs> Basically, uh, groups, a group in frenzy, uh, spontaneously and without itself being aware of how it is doing this, uh, settles on one of its uh, members, usually a, uh, a notably weak <laughs> member in some way or other, on whom, or, or it could be a notably strong member, but a, a notably exceptional member in some way or other, who is, um, who is cast out, exiled, killed, lynched, whatever. And then mysteriously the group finds itself at peace hmm. um, because they've all participated in this uh, lynching, this driving out of the evil one, and immediately the one is driven out, they found that they were right to drive the person out because they are now at peace. Therefore, he must have caused the problem that led to, right. <laughs> to him being driven out. It's a perfectly circular, magical form of, of logic, but one which is familiar to all of us. Right. Um, and that, uh, suggested uh, Girard, was the basis for culture. In other words, that rather than what we call religion being uh, a late add-on to much more banal uh, domestic and economic uh, issues in which, by which humans set up culture. Actually, it was something like 
a pre-sacrifice. It wasn't yet a sacrifice because it was uh, there wasn't uh, a substitutionary victim. The victim was real. Right, right. <laughs> um, uh, it, it only becomes a sacrifice when there is a second substitution of something else, something as a stand-in for the real victim. Mm -hmm. um, but that something like that is at the basis of all human societies and institutions. In other words, that if you like, it was the it was the sacred which formed us, not us who invented the sacred. <laughs> um, and the third part of his thought was the realization that while that tendency which he has just described can be shown to underlie a huge number of the myths and stories and rites and prohibitions of cultures all across the world. There is a strange exception in the case of the Jewish and later Christian texts in that they show exactly the same mechanism at work as he had found elsewhere, but turned on its head in that it's the victim is constantly declared to be, consistently declared to be innocent. <laughs> and those engaged in the lynching, rather than being uh, the good guys bringing law and order out of uh, a nasty mess, are seen to be what they are, lying persecutors, whose peace is a form of uh, self-congratulation and, and, and lying. So murderous mendacity. So those three elements, if you like, the desire according to the desire of the other, the mechanism of the adultery victim and the, the Judeo-Christian undoing from within of the mechanism. Those would be the three central points of Girard's thought. And, and this last point sort of uh, uh, has a link with Girard's own personal life, correct? He, he, he came back to Catholicism as Christianity, indeed, right? Indeed, indeed. Yep. And he describes it very movingly in uh, 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 an interview, a book-length interview he gave uh, to Pier Paolo Antonello and... Uh, um, Jean César de Castro Rocha called Evolution and Conversion. He describes that process uh, very beautifully. Yes, um, but as, as he himself said, it was his, it was the logic of his thought <laughs> that brought him back to Christianity rather sure. than Christianity that brought him back. <laughs> sure, and uh, so can, can you understand uh, Girard's theory without Christianity or? Yes, and I mean there are a number of distinguished, there are a number of distinguished uh, followers of Girard's thought who have no um, particular interest in Christianity as such, um, but who see the extraordinary explanatory power it has for social phenomena, uh, which we observe uh, clearly the whole time <laughs> all around us. Right, right. Uh, in addition, of course, there are people from other religious backgrounds who've taken an interest in, in Girard's thought. So, yes, I mean, one of the criticisms of it that sometimes people make is that it's very, uh, it's very Christianocentric. And there's one sense in which that's true, but it's also true that the whole of its explanatory power is available to anybody without any personal uh, adhesion to either that particular religious belief or indeed any religious belief at all. Right, right. <laughs> and, 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 this, and this idea flips a lot of sort of fundamental beliefs or, or traditional understandings about Christianity, sort of flips them on their head a bit, right? Indeed, yeah. And I think that that's been one of the most significant uh, features of the appeal of, of Girard's thought amongst Christian thinkers, especially in Protestant circles, has been the way in which it beautifully undoes the uh, penal sub substitution theory reading of the atonement po popularized by Calvin, based on St. Anselm, but popularized by, by Luther and then Calvin, which became for many evangelical churches the if you like, the be-all and end-all of, uh, of their dogma. Um, and it's a way of thinking that does posit some sort of violence in God that needs satisfying in some way or other. And Girard's account, uh, understanding of the way violence and the sacred works, enables, for the first time in a very long time, a, an understanding of Christ's death that is at least as conservative as any <laughs> uh, upheld by uh, them, but completely reverses the polarities in the vengeful understanding, such that, that no violence at all is attributed to God. And in fact, uh, we see God offering himself in sacrifice to us. You know, if there, if there is a violent divinity in the picture, it is us. <laughs> right. If, if there is someone who needs their vengeance, their thirst for vengeance slaked, <laughs> it's us. Yeah. And I think that that's been that's been a huge um, relief for very many 
uh, evangelicals as well, of course, as Catholics. But that sure. particular has been a very rich source of uh, a very rich source of discovery for for evangelicals in America and elsewhere. Now, do you think that Girard's theories are uh, meant for only the the theologians or the intellectuals, or do you think that some of his uh, thoughts could help um, sort of the everyday Catholic, the lay person? Um, I know you've you've said before that you think he and Merton were getting at similar ideas. Yes, well, I think I mean I, if I can answer your question in two ways. The first is to say that it's not at all the case that Girard's thought is particularly limited to intellectuals and academics. I mean, one of the really interesting things about it is that the triangular mimetic theory of desire can instantly be picked up by any adolescent with any experience of how love affairs work. Right. <laughs> I mean, it really is easy to tweak to it, and once you start tweaking to it, you can pick it up. Uh, you pick up the consequences of it everywhere. It makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. So, you know... What I've noticed, having been teaching it for, oh, um, you know, 25, 30, 30 something years now, is um, that there's no correlation between the intelligence or the degree of education of people and their ability to grasp, <laughs> <laughs> to grasp the theory. None at all. Uh, the dumbest people get it at once and the brightest people can't make sense of it <laughs> and every, every other variant of that in between that you can, uh, that you can imagine. So that's the first point. But the second, uh, second point is that, yeah, this is a, a way of thinking that has been picked up by practitioners of all sorts, not only uh, by any means um, theologians, but uh, economists, philosophers, um, peace workers, uh, prison wardens, mm -hmm. uh, sh shrinks of various different sorts, of excuse the language. Um, in other words, the, the, the range of people employing uh, Girard's insights in quite different and I think unexpected uh, fields is enormous. And yes, um, there are, it, it is able to help. Uh, lay people in their in their lives. There's, I mean, s several of us have written introductions of one sort or another to Girard's thought with that in mind. Some with a more Protestant audience, some with a more Catholic audience, some with a more ecumenical audience in mind. Including myself, I've written a little introduction to Christianity, actually quite a big introduction to Christianity, called Jesus the Forgiving Victim. And there are sessions on that, applying Girard's thought to prayer, to liturgy, to surviving violence in the church, if you like, all of the <laughs> kinds sure. of things which are pretty much day-to-day day-to-day -day occurrences for, for, for most uh, uh, Catholics or believers in general. Mm -hmm. and what, do you think, what do you think explains this, this, this broad appeal of Girard, not only to that goes across academic disciplines, across all walks of life, but also there, it transcends sort of ideological strains. He, he reaches across both the left and the right and the center, or so-called. Yeah. Yes, I think that's right. That, that is one of the, the extraordinary things that I've noticed about it is how and other people have noticed this about this as well, is how it excites interest both from people on the right and the left and, as you say, the, the centre. I think that's for, a, you know, in, in one sense, quite a simple meaning. It's at the centre of Girard's thought is an understanding both of how order and disorder are created. <laughs> mm -hmm. And typically, those on the right come to Girard attracted by what they see as an account of how order is created, and <laughs> those on the left... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, uh, from how disorder is created, and they both realize that they're implicated in each other and find that Girard is, is not quite able to be reached either by their, if you like, by their friendly antennas or by their unfriendly antennas, mm -hmm. with the result that they then become quite interested and able to talk to other people unlike themselves. So really we have amazingly ecumenical, uh, not only in the religious but in the political sense, <laughs> Right. <laughs> meetings uh, at all levels. And it's something I've noticed not only in the United States or in the United Kingdom, but in France as well and Spain. So countries with, with their own sorts of polarization. Uh, uh -huh. In all of those countries, I found the, uh, if you like, the, exactly the point that you say, the interpolitical and the interreligious capabilities of this thought quite astounding. And so what are, what are the next steps for Girardians, as they're, as they're called? Gosh, apart from taking stock of quite what an amazing uh, uh, teacher we have had and what an amazing richness of thought and text he's left us, um, <laughs> I mean, constantly to look for applying his thought, for leaving lots of unanswered questions, uh, 
better researched than, than René himself ever wanted or tried to do. Uh, to do. One of the things that I uh, am trying to do at the moment is I'm trying to make sure that, that the full editions of his texts are available in Spanish. And many of his books have been available in Spanish, but in, uh, let's say, uh, irregular translations and not easily available. So, you know, there are in, in different language groups we're trying to get out um, more and better editions of the original text so that people can learn for themselves. But also organizing summer schools and um, other forms of uh, interaction with pupils, both at advanced levels and at much more um, popular levels all around the all around the world. So that's one thing. But also there are research projects um, uh, that are going on into into various aspects of his thought, particularly as it affects uh, economic crisis. On on the, on the one hand, issues to do with archaeology, paleontology, and how we became human. On the other, um, you know, there are many many questions raised by Girard's thought, and what is essentially a very rich hypothesis enables us to approach each of those questions in very new way. Uh, as with all hypotheses, mm -hmm. you know, they they are more than statements of fact. They are uh, ways of posing a question that themselves throw light on what is to be questioned. <laughs> and that's, yeah, that's great. Which is, um, which is rather uh, wonderful, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for helping us uh, pause to remember the great person that we've lost, the great teacher and great thinker, um, who is Rene Girard. And, and if I can say that he wasn't only those things, he was also an extraordinarily approachable, uh, friendly, affectionate, simple, humble, person, not at all anyone's image of a, uh, a daunting French intellectual, though daunting his intellect <laughs> undoubtedly was, yet uh, I don't think that anybody who came across him could uh, be other than uh, uh, affected by his complete, relaxed, uh, unpretentious, unself-important nature, a very, very astounding person. That's really beautiful. That's good. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Father Allison. Oh, and my pleasure. And best wishes. Thanks very much indeed. Good night. Good night.